There we Alrighty, go. here we go. We are live. Good morning. Those of you online, Happy New Year. Those of you here, Happy New Year. Good group out for a cold morning on a holiday weekend. So very uh, thankful for each of you that uh, are here. I want to mention something online. Those of you online, um, I have an outline that I refer to. Uh, you are there. I am here. You don't have one, but I do email it to people. So if you want one, uh, those of you online, email me and I will send you one every Sunday morning. Right, Dick? Yep. Send, you, send you an outline so that you can uh, hopefully follow along a little bit better. So here we are, the beginning of 2022. Amen. So how do you approach a new year? I won't ask for a show of hands, but my guess is you fall into one of three categories. One, it's just another day. Kind of like birthdays, right? Just another day. Uh, but there's a Bible verse about that, actually. I, I'm not having you turn there. I, don't, I didn't have room on the outline, so I left it off. But Romans 14, verse 5 says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And I'm not entirely sure of the context there, but I don't believe you can scold people if they say it's just another day. And vice versa, you can't scold people if they make a little more of it than another day. Uh, number two, a second attitude you could have is that it is a good time to remember and to reflect back on uh, the past year. In uh, Jesus' seven letters, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, Jesus, John's revelation, but uh, the revelation of Christ, really, in the seven letters to the churches, each letter, Jesus says this, I know thy works. And by virtue of Jesus saying, I know your works, he reminded those churches, and of course the individuals within those churches, that, hey, if God knows your works, that's a reminder of our works as well. And so there is some, some benefit in uh, looking back, reflecting, evaluating. And then there's a third attitude that you could have, and uh, it is this. It's a good time to, to make plans and prepare for changes in the upcoming year. Yeah. If you shoot at absolutely nothing, that is what you'll hit. And so it's good to reflect and make plans. And if you, ah, uh, it's just another day, then okay, it was yesterday, so don't worry about it. Today's today. But anyway, um, mentioned kind of in passing last week that we're, again, going to look at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, Pew Bible, page 704. If you're using Pew Bible 704, otherwise Matthew 2. And we're going to look again at Mary and Joseph and the young Christ and the wise men. And we've already seen how the wise men sought for, for the purpose of finding Christ so that they could worship him. And today we're going to look at what happened after that. They found Christ, they worshiped him, they left, and kind of continue on uh, with the narrative though. And, and as we see God's provision and God's protection and some other things that they go through, both the wise men and Mary and Joseph and Jesus, uh, there are some principles there that we can use, that we can ponder on to help us prepare for the new year. So let's, uh, let's ask God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, I thank you for those that you brought out. Uh, Lord, it's uh, cold outside. Uh, maybe a little cooler in here than people would like, but uh, we certainly have heat, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we thank you for uh, the blessing of getting us through the past year. Uh, Lord, as we already mentioned, there's certainly we can look back and, and uh, mourn. Uh, we can look back and lament, uh, or we can look back and learn, and we can certainly look ahead and uh, Lord, we thank you for your word that reminds us of truths that we can uh, use to prepare us for the year ahead. And Lord, we certainly don't know uh, what lies ahead. We don't know what a day may bring forth, much less what a year is going to bring forth. Uh, and yet we thank you for uh, your son that died to give us the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we thank you for your word 
where you make promises to us that you will keep. And so we thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you would help us to consider now these truths. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would see the importance of not only uh, knowing your word, but trusting your word and trusting the God that's behind the word. And uh, Lord, that we would not just be hearers, but that we would also be doers. So again, I thank you for each one that's here. I thank you for those that are listening online now, those that will listen later. Uh, thank you that you know hearts and you can speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we would uh, submit to uh, your moving in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So number one, principle number one, you're here in Matthew chapter two. Principle number one is God provides for his children. God provides for his children. Verse number 11, when they were coming into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Uh, these were gifts fit for a king, not a six-month to 18-month-old child. There's some interesting theological suggestions as to why these three gifts, and we, we talked about those on Wednesday, but uh, this morning we're going to look at the reality that there was a practical reason. God sent them to Egypt, and they needed travel funds yeah. to get to Egypt. And so there's a very practical reason that they got uh, these, the wise men brought uh, these things. Look at verses uh, 13 and 14, and when they were departed, that's uh, the wise men, uh, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt. And so it's pretty safe to say that Joseph and Mary did not take these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and tuck them away and hide them until Jesus got to be of age and then... No, they used them to travel and to live on. So they used what was given to Jesus to take care of themselves plus Jesus. But underneath that is the principle that God provides for his children. It was true of Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and it is true of us. God does provide for his children. We're going to come back to here, but you're not far away. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is a good chapter to be reminded of. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus himself teaches us that God will take care of his children. Matthew 6, if you're using Pew Bibles, page 707. 707, can't spend a lot of time on this chapter, but I just want to highlight a few things. Letter A on your outline, God knows what you need. God knows what you need. Sometimes we think uh, he doesn't, or, you know, we prep and all. God knows what you need. We have that here. Look at verse number 8, middle of verse 8. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. God knows what you need. And I need. Verse number 32. Again, middle of the verse. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. What things? The things in verse 31. Food, clothing, something to drink, basic necessities. God, had, God knows that you need those things. So God knows what you need. Letter B. God meets the needs of of things he loves less. So you may think, what? Uh, letter B, God meets the needs of things he loves best. Does God love everything he created exactly the same way? The answer is no. God did not die for turtles or sparrows or toads. God died for us. And God tells us, Jesus reminds us in this verse that, you know what? God takes care of the needs of lesser things, and consequently, he is going to take care of your needs. Look at verse number 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, 
nor gather into barns. If you don't see your sparrows out there, well, you might see them out there in your garden, but you know they don't have a little mini hoe, and they're not planting rows of stuff to, uh, you know, watering it, getting it all ready, and then harvest in the fall and put it in the barn. They don't do that. Why? Because God feeds them. Now, the verse goes on, Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Now, we all know that God uses us sometimes to feed birds, right, Deanna? Um, and Louise, Louise you know, just has her head in the refrigerator, literally, so she will not hear what I'm saying. But anyway, don't look. Just keep up here. Um, so, but God uses people to feed sparrows, but God feeds them. God takes care of the sparrows. Another verse in the Bible says a sparrow does not die without God knowing about it. And then at the end of the verse, it says this. Verse 26, Matthew 6, 26, Are ye not much better than they? Why did Jesus ask that question? Jesus asked that question so you would have a big theological discussion in your mind of, oh, am I worth more than sparrows? Am I more valuable? No, it's a rhetorical question. Of course you are better than sparrows. And listen, if God feeds and takes care of sparrows, he is going to feed and take care of you. That is, that is the point of Jesus' question. Since God takes care of them, he will take care of us. Let her see. God promises to take care of, still here in Matthew 6, God promises to take care of your needs if you put him first. Okay? Uh, we can't be reckless. We can't spend money we don't have and then think, ask, expect God to bail us out. God gives us a promise here in this verse, but it's really a conditional promise. Verse 60, uh, 33, chapter 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Put God first, and God will take care of you. Amen. That's a good verse to memorize, and it's a good verse to claim, and it is a promise. Mm -hmm. Shall be added unto you. It doesn't say maybe, or could be added unto you, or possibly, or should be. Uh, it says will be. There are no exclusion clauses. It doesn't say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you unless things get really bad. It doesn't say that. We put him first. He will take care of our needs. That is a promise from God. Uh, I was, I think it was Thursday, I was listening to VCY Crosstalk, and uh, Alex Newman was on, and Alex Newman is with uh, New American, I think, and yeah. And uh, he was talking about digital currency. He was talking about the, the planned demolition, was his word, of the economy that some people want to see happen. Talking about the one world government that want, want to, you know, some people want to see happen. And then uh, it was kind of, he mentioned in passing that he preached. I didn't know he was a preacher. But then he gave this reminder. Maybe some of you heard this. Uh, he said, you know what? No matter what happens, we should not live in fear. God fed Elijah with ravens. And you know what? We don't know what the future holds, but God takes care of his children. And when he said that, I got to thinking afterwards, uh, yeah, God fed Elijah with ravens first, and then the brook dried up, and then God sent Elijah to the widow woman of Zarephath, and she was there taking her last handful of flour and her last little bit of oil to make her last little cake so her and her son could eat it and die. And Elijah said, you're not going to die. Feed me first. Put, put me, feed me first. Was that selfish? No, I think it was seek ye first the kingdom of God. Take care of God's man. Feed me first. And you know what the Bible says? They ate off from a handful of flour and a little bit of oil for, it says many days, all right, but until rain comes, and the rain was withheld for three and a half years, so it certainly was months, if not years, that God took care of Elijah and this woman and her son with miraculously. And so, you know what? God is able and willing to take care of us. We need to seek first his kingdom. 
if the economy crashes and Social Security ends and all those kind of things. Listen, that doesn't, oh, Matthew 6.33 doesn't count anymore. I was, God, none of these things take God by surprise. Okay? We need to count on the fact that God is going to take care of us, but we need to seek first his kingdom. Back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2, again, page 704. Principle 1, God provides for his children. Principle number 2, God protects his children. God protects his children. Look at verse number 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they, the wise men, should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. God warned them not to go back to Herod. Why? Was Herod going to hurt them? We don't know. What about this? What if Herod, probably he himself wouldn't go, but has his executioners with sword point under the wise men and say, take us back to him and march them back to Bethlehem right to where Christ was and have him killed. We don't know why God warned them to go another way, but you know what? God protected them and God protected Mary, Joseph, and the young Christ because while all that was taking place, God had also told them to head to Egypt. Verse number 13, they departed. The angel of the Lord read this verse already, appeared to Joseph, arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. So God, even though when the, when the wise men came to Herod, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And he checks with the scribes and the chief priests. Oh, Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Uh, hey, hey, wise men, go to Bethlehem, find him, worship him, come back, tell me so I can go worship him. Um, they didn't know if Herod was being insincere, but God knew. And so God had warned them to go back another way and had Mary and Joseph and the young Christ flee as well. They were long gone before uh, they figured out, you know, before Herod figured out, hey, the, the wise men disobeyed my command. They ditched me. They left. Christ. The young, the young Christ was protected. So we have the protection of the wise men, the protection of Christ and his parents. And so it would easy to be, it, it'd be easy to say there, they were protected. But if you're familiar with the account, and we've looked at it a couple of different times, um, there was some people not protected. Let her see. We have the perplexity regarding God's Protection. Per perplexity. There's some confusion sometimes uh, in our minds about God's protection. God's children die. Recently, Mary Harris, 2021, Bev, Jean, Karen lost family members, my mom passed away. God's children die. They die. And so we see in this passage that Herod was angry. Verse 16, very angry when he found out the wise men did not report back. And so he had a number of babies killed. Uh, historians say population of Bethlehem was about a thousand at that time. I don't know how they figure it out. It was about a thousand at that time, and children under two years of age would have been about 20 or 30, and uh, take away the girls, you know, there was probably 15, 20 children killed. It wasn't thousands like we maybe think, or I mentioned a couple weeks ago. But still, 20, 30 helpless babies that were not protected. <coughs> Why? The answer is, the, the pat answer and the real answer is, we don't know why. We do not know why. And we need to be content with not knowing why. You know, you've heard me say this before. If you 
if, if God is small enough for you to figure out, you can have that God. I don't want that one. I like one who can't be figured out. He is God. We are not. He is all-knowing. We are not. He knows our appointment day. We do not. And we have one. I have a couple quotes on your sheets. We, we live by faith and not fear. George Whitfield is credited with saying, We are immortal until our work is done. Think about that. That's a good one to roll around in your mind. We are immortal until God is done with us. That's an awesome thought. General Stonewall Jackson. Uh, I like this one too. My religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. That was his belief. I am equally safe sleeping as I am in the middle of the battlefield because God <laughs> controls my destiny. He went on to say, God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me. This is the way all men should live, and then all would be equally brave. Our time is in God's hands. You think about that. We have choices. We can live in fear and do everything we can to protect ourselves and die on God's appointment day. Or we could live in faith and do what God wants to do and die on God's appointment day. You can live in fear. I'm not going to. Principle one, God provides for his children. Principle two, God protects his children. Principle number three, God prompts his children. Okay, guides is better, but I needed a P, and you know how I am with my keeping the same letters. So God prompts, he guides, and he leads his children to do certain things. And we see that throughout this chapter. Uh, verse 12, God warned the wise men through a dream to go home a different way. Verse 13, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream to flee into Egypt. Verse 19 and 20, but when Haran was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Take the young child, come back to, come back to Israel. Verse 22, end of the verse, we again see Joseph being warned of God in a dream to go to a specific part of Galilee, Nazareth. So it would be really easy to read a chapter like this and say, God speaks to people through dreams. And I need to count on dreams to have direction from God. And I say, no. Because the Word of God was not complete at this time. And the Spirit of God was not indwelling in people because Jesus had not died and risen again. We have the Word of God. We have the completed Word of God. And we have the Holy Spirit. So how should we view dreams? I've actually run into more people here uh, that put stock in dreams than any other place that I've lived in, in the state. And I've lived in a few. So how should we view dreams? Letter A, the danger of dreams. The danger of dreams. Why is there danger in dreams? Some point number one, they are easily influenced. The food we eat, the medication we take, the movie we just watched, the game we just played on a computer, being sick, all those kind of things can affect your dreams. They are easily influenced. I'm guessing a number of you have had dreams. You've had you've watched a movie and Wow, I dreamed about something in that movie. I watched the Hallmark movie with my wife last night. And I had a dream. I, I thought it was funny because I'm preparing for this and then I actually had a dream. I don't have dreams every night. I don't remember them. I had a dream that somebody broke into the house and I always get beat up. I never win. I, I'm not, I don't know what's up with that. I always lose. But, you know, what am I to think of that? Well, the obvious reason is we need to hire a full-time security guy at our house because I had a dream. No, 
wow, that's craziness. <laughs> Dreams are easily influenced. Number two, they are subjective in interpretation. Subjective. That means they are, we interpret them according to personal preferences or whims or feelings. There's not something cut and dried that we base it on. Imagine waking up this morning telling you that story, or, wife, I know you like dogs. You are going to be happy to know that I had a dream about 101 Dalmatians last night, and so we're going to go buy them. We're going to go find 100. That's craziness. But if it wasn't so stupid, I mean, uh oh, sorry, I said that word. I shouldn't say that. But, um, you know, there are people that put stock in dreams. They're easily influenced. You can interpret them any way you want. And you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. They, God appeared to them in a dream. And I'm going to argue that it was before we had the Bible. And it was before we had the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, letter B, safety in Scripture. Safety in Scripture. God now uses His Word to guide us. And really, if you think about the dreams of Joseph, and you think about the dreams of Daniel, somehow God gave them the interpretation of those dreams. They credit God as giving them the interpretation of those dreams. So it wasn't having a dream and them making stuff up. It was God gave them factual information, and we know it was factual information because the way they interpreted the dream is exactly how it happened. Joseph's dream. There's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. That's exactly what happened. So there is safety in Scripture. They had words from God somehow about those dreams. And we have God's complete, inerrant, unchanging word. Proverbs 2, verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Proverbs says a number of different verses talk about in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Why? Because you get a whole bunch of counselors together and majority rules and, okay, these ten things. No, it's because if counseling is comes from this book, if wisdom comes from this book, then from the same source, they're all going to have the same counsel. And so God gives wisdom. And there is safety in scriptures. Let us see the process of prompting. So how does God use the Bible to lead us? How does God use the Bible? There is no verse that says, Kevin Mikey, I want you to go and be the pastor in First Baptist Church of Nesita when they call you, if they call you. There's no verse that says that. There's no verse for a number of things that we do on a daily basis, and yet we believe God wants us to do them. So how, do, how does God use his word and his spirit to guide us, to instruct us, to, to prompt us? A number of different stories I could have given. I want to uh, give you this one. Some of you are familiar with this. Back in, in August, uh, a woman called my cell phone number. Of course, the cell phone number is on the sign. It's uh, on the website. It's in a number of of different places, so not unusual, and, and she wanted some pastoral counsel, uh, or so it seemed, and I said, you know what, I'll meet with you as long as I'm, my wife is with me or another person, mm -hmm. and um, she was fine with that, and then she even called, she called when I was out to lunch with Mike Pelletier, the one time he and I went out to lunch, uh, she called, and uh, he actually talked to her. And she agreed to come to church that night. And we were going to talk to her afterwards. She didn't show. And then she was going to, we were going to meet with her the next day to talk to her. And she didn't show. 
but she still kept contacting me. And, you know, she called me. I wanted to help her. I wanted to sit down with her. I wanted to take God's word and show her that God is the answer to her problems, not me. And that the number one problem that she has is that she needs to be born again. And so I wanted to, I wanted to do that. I, I actually, I even envisioned an unshackled kind of situation where here's a woman who is just in the depths of despair and problems and gets saved and turns her life around. And that, that's what I had, was willing to do. Bible says, and I think I have this verse, you know, someone for someone to be saved, they need to call on the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the verse goes on, Paul goes on to say, uh, how shall they hear it? How, how shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they, uh, um, maybe I should just read it instead of butchering it here. <laughs> how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard. For people to call upon the name of the Lord, they need to believe on the Lord. But in order to believe on the Lord, they need to know who the Lord is and why they need to call on him. And so I wanted to sit down with her and show her that. But other verses came to mind. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Verses of the seductive woman in Proverbs, number of verses in Proverbs talk about that. And so God was leading me to do this. I wanted to get something in her hands. And so we have here at church a little book, Bible Promises, uh, that has table of contents, and if you're struggling with fear, that's verses on fear. If you're struggling with anxiety, verses on anxiety. And so I put it in an envelope. I knew she was at a particular campground. There's a camp office there, and I took that little booklet, and I, that envelope, dropped it off at the campground, texted her after I was miles away, and said, it is there at that campground. Never heard from her. Did she get it? Actually, I did hear from her, but it was, I think she was texting somebody else because it was weird. But anyway, that's another story. But the point is, um, I wanted to get her the word of God, but God was also saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. And so God used his word, but also uses the Holy Spirit to prompt us on how to apply there's one meaning to scripture one meaning but many applications and so I, I remember I was struggling with something and and our my pastor wisely told me and I'm going to pass this on to you uh, there's a decision I had to make it's something I was kind of wrestling with he says ask God to give you a verse ask God to give you a verse something that you can put your finger on, that God used his word to, to prompt my heart. And so one more thing about uh, God's prompting, and, and it is this, letter D, the prerequisites of God's prompting. Does God guide all his children or just some? What does God look for in people that he guides? What does God look for in people that he prompts? Not surprisingly, and we know again from this passage, from the wise men and Joseph, number one, God looks for obedience. God looks for obedience. Matthew 1, 20, angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary. Joseph took Mary to be his wife. Matthew 2, 8, they're instructed, the wise men are instructed to go to Bethlehem. They go to Bethlehem. Verse 12, the wise men are instructed not to go back to Herod. They obeyed, did not go back to Herod. 
Joseph is instructed, verse 13, go into Egypt. He goes into Egypt. Verse 20, Joseph is instructed to come back to Israel. Joseph comes back to Israel. There was obedience. It is impossible to miss the truth in this that we need, if we, we need to obey what God tells us to do. God will not, I don't believe, God will not lead you if you are a picker and a chooser. Well, God, tell me what you want, and if I like it, and if I think it's a good idea, then I'll do it. No. I don't believe God's going God's to lead you. We need to obey what God says. I have a quote here. Oswald uh, Chambers, in his devotional, uh, wrote this. No one ever receives a word from God without instantly being put to the test regarding it. Then he says, we disobey and then wonder why we are not growing spiritually. Mm -hmm. Disobey and then wonder why we're not growing. Ask yourself this question. Is God going to lead you to do something when you refused to do the last thing he asked you to do? Probably not. God prompts us and leads us and guides us when we obey what he has already told us to do. Another prerequisite, last sub-point there, is faith. We not only need to do what God says, we need to believe what he says. Again, Joseph listened to the angel and took Mary because he believed the angel when the angel said that which is born in her of her is conceived of the Holy Ghost. He believed those words. She is not unfaithful. She did not do wrong. She did not shame me. She did not shame her name. She did not shame her parents. I believe because the angel told me that she is of child miraculously. The wise men believed they would find Jesus in Bethlehem. That is why they went there. Verse 13, Je Joseph is told to go to Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. He waited, he believed he would get the word to leave there, and he waited until he got that word. So do you, do I, do we want to be led by God? If we do, then we need to do what they did. We need to obey what God says. We need to believe what God says. So here we have it, three principles to ponder as we go into 2022. What is 2022 going to bring? We don't know. But we do know God will provide for us as we seek first his kingdom. God will protect us until our time on this earth is done. And God will prompt us. He will lead us. He will guide us as long as we obey what he says and believe what he says. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for your word. It is so rich. There is so much here. Uh, Lord, we've been in this chapter for a long time already, a number of weeks, and yet there's still more. And we just thank you for these principles uh, that we can look at. Uh, we see your provision in the life of Mary and Joseph and the young Christ. Uh, we see your protection. Uh, we see your prompting, your guidance in their life. And Lord, we know that each of these principles uh, are in your word and they're applicable to us. They are principles that we can count on. There are principles uh, we can claim in our own situation because uh, they're towards your children. They're timeless truths, so to speak, Lord. And, and I just pray that you would encourage our hearts, uh, Lord, that uh, we would uh, consider these things, uh, that we would claim these things, that we would be encouraged by them. Uh, Lord, what a blessing it is to uh, go into the unknown uh, having your word and the stability 
and the comfort and the promises that it gives. And Lord, again, I thank you uh, that you know our hearts. And Lord, we, we certainly recognize that at times we are slow to obey. Uh, there are times that we contemplate, we critique, we reconsider what you've said and try and decide if we should obey it or not. And Lord, I just pray that we would have a heart that says we will obey immediately, uh, cheerfully, with joy, uh, because uh, knowing that it pleases you and that it will be best for us. And again, Lord, if there's any here that know not Christ, <coughs> Lord, they need to become your children. And so you work in their heart as well. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what would God have us do in light of his word? First and foremost, make sure you're a child of God. Uh, these provisions do not get you to heaven. These God's provisions and God's protection and God's prompting don't come to the unsaved. They come to God's children. So we need to make sure we're a child of God. Number two, if you are a child of God, uh, I, we should have a renewed enthusiasm to do what God says. We need to know what he says. We need to do what he says. We need to have faith. And so we, we need to have a desire for obedience. But I think we should also... God didn't just speak and he's done. God still speaks. God wants me to do certain things. God wants me to serve. God's word and God's spirit will direct me to do certain things. That should be exciting to us. And that should be something uh, that we seek. 462. Art and Don are going to come. Jesus, I am resting, resting. 400. And 62. Please stand if you are able to. 462. 